most of the time I feel very grateful for everything that it actually teaches me because I learned so much about myself, but also so much about the society where I am. And that's a real blessing. Hi, I'm Kim Tolson and I'm the Traveling Therapist. It's my passion to teach therapists how to navigate online private practices and multiple income streams so they can travel the world. I'm a digital nomad with a virtual insurance-based private therapy practice and a multi six-figure coaching business. I'm obsessed with entrepreneurship and developing tools that can help therapists live an adventurous lifestyle. In this podcast, I will discuss my journey as a digital nomad, I'll chat with other traveling therapists, and help you navigate the complexities of running an online insurance-based practice. I'm so glad to have you with me on this journey. Building a private practice can be challenging. I know for me, when I was starting out, I had no idea how to get referrals. I had no idea how to manage paperwork. I knew nothing about insurance billing. The whole process was really daunting. Building a private practice can be challenging to say the least. I remember when I was starting out, I had no idea how to get referrals. I had no idea how to navigate insurance. I had no idea even what paperwork was required. So growing a caseload, navigating insurance, and managing billing and paperwork all take significant amounts of time. And that's all in addition to delivering great care to your clients. That's why Alma gives clinicians the tools they need to build a thriving private practice. When you join their insurance program, you can get credentialed within 45 days and access to enhanced reimbursement rates. They also handle all the paperwork from eligibility checks to claim submissions, and they guarantee payment within two weeks of each appointment. So in addition to their insurance program, Alma also offers time-saving tools and administrative support. So you can spend less less time on paperwork and more time delivering great care to your clients and the traveling world. Learn more about building a thriving private practice with Alma at helloalma.com slash Kim. That's hello, A-L-M-A dot com slash K-Y-M to get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Traveling Therapist Podcast. I have Anna Linda here with us today. Really excited about this one because it's sort of outside of the box from what we usually get. So she has got a very interesting story and I'd love to just turn it over to you, Anna, and just ask you to begin with, how did you go from being like your typical therapist to a traveling therapist? That's a great question. Uh, And thank you for for letting me join you. Uh, It's really fun to talk with others about your passion and how you can you know, like create or build on your dream life. Um, and it, I think I went because I, I have a bachelor degree in social work uh, and I studied the cognitive behavioral therapy. And I was so excited, like coming out and understanding the processes and like, yeah, I can do it. And not that long time after, I felt like really empowered and really like full of knowledge. I was like, wow. This is not like, this is not giving me the answers that I thought, or no, this is not bringing me into the process that I thought I, I understood or like I was unfolding. Yeah. And so I had the opportunity when COVID hit, both to work more online from the healthcare section where I was working in Sweden at that point. Um, and I also got a space in a dance and movement therapy education course that I also did like side by side um, and we also got a space in the master in sexology that I finished so I was doing these three things like in parallel and it worked so good to do it online um, and while I was studying the dance and movement therapy and the sexology I realized that it's basically the same thing dance and sex it's too very embodied states where you connect with yourself or with other people in an interaction where the quality is really important. Um, So based on those COVID years, I just realized that I could do something really special and I could actually do it while I was traveling. That is amazing. What a fascinating combination for a therapist. To have that special, oh my God, 
And if we have time, I'd love to get into, you know, like how, what does that look like online versus in person? Because I would imagine in person, like workshops or movement type things, but I guess we can do it online as well. That is so awesome. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's really interesting when you understand the mechanisms, then you can work with it, not exactly in the same way, but you can like 95% in the same way online. And usually when I have clients in their home or in their own safe environment, it saves them time, but it also gives them the opportunity or the possibility to choose the space where they want to be. Uh, so it gives different things in the sessions. That's amazing. Now, did, did you complete all of this education like when you were in Sweden? Or I know you also mentioned before we hit record that you're also Brazilian. So I'm just curious. <laughs> Where, where did your degrees come from? I'm, just, I'm so interested, you know, where you got your degrees and how you can use them in different countries and are there regulations? You know, I'm just curious about all that. Yeah. 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 And there's a lot of regulations, um, which I didn't like a hundred percent figure out how to organize, uh, organize myself around because as, as a clinical social worker, there is one type of authorizations and there is legalizations around the counseling or uh, the psychotherapy. And then dance and movement therapists have their own uh, oh certifications or authorization things. And also sexologists have their own. Um, so wow. I didn't 100% figure out which ones I should continue to, to do or to take. Um, but I have my authorizations and legalizations in Sweden which is okay. where I took all of these educations. Okay. But I also started an education to be a somatic sexologist in a private uh, school in Canada. Um, and then I also took um, certification as a sex coach with, uh, what's the name? World Association of Sex Coaches, TWASC. Um, so that gives me the freedom to coach, like, uh, in the countries where my clients are. Um, but the therapy sessions I do within the Swedish regulation. I'll do this is how I, <laughs> That's how I do that. So all, all of those clients with that regulation you keep in, in Sweden, you keep, you see them back in Sweden and not other countries. I got you. Okay. Well, I, you're mostly, that's how I do it. I do have like, it's, it's a little tricky to understand because my clients are all over the world. Um, yeah. So usually when they come and they present a situation or a problem or a challenge, then we start about talking like what is clean therapy and what can we do in coaching and how can we differ these two and how can we work like side by side or how can we work in like a package form to still give them the information and the understanding of themselves that they need and yeah. Um, yeah and sexology is a lot about education and it's a lot about the embodiment and the inner stories of yourself which you can use for example dance and movement therapy or embodiment as tools to discover so it works really good to combine these fields yeah. um yeah, I, I kind of forgot the question. You said something <laughs> where, I, uh, I don't just, where I took the grid. The grid. Yeah. This was the question. Yeah, I'm curious yeah. how, how you're making it work with the different certifications because like in the United States, it, it's sort of some gray areas, you know, like I, you know, have to see my clients with my license and they have to be in the state of Virginia in the United States when I'm seeing them. But then there's gray areas where, you know, if a client from Germany contacted me and wanted to work with me, my licensure doesn't necessarily matter then, but there's a lot of nuances around that. So I'm, I'm always curious when I talk to people, especially that are licensed in other countries, like how, like what are the regulations and how do you make that work? So it's interesting. It sounds like you have, yeah. to, you have to take in whoever's contacting you and then decide based on your regulations or your coaching skill set which one would apply depending on where that client's located, it sounds like to me. Yeah, and what type of work does this client actually need? Uh, because I do have, I have, I work with in the healthcare sector in Sweden still. And in okay. Sweden, the, the legalization to be a counselor or a psychotherapist is for all Sweden. 
So it means that I can take on clients from abroad in my Swedish company. Yeah. And then I do use the same like legalization that I have in Sweden because it's in my Swedish company. Uh, so that's also a way I can do it if it's like specifically therapy sessions or like a specific therapy plan or model that we're working with. So it's a little easier in Sweden than what it is. Yeah. Ah, oh, so interesting. Yeah. So let's let's shift just a little bit because when before we hit record, I was like, where are you? And you said you're sitting in Thailand right now. And you you've been there for a little bit. I would I would love if you could share your story one because it's so new, unique who you're traveling with and then maybe just give us a little idea of like where you traveled and how you're making those decisions and all of that stuff that's been amazing to hear about yeah so um when i started to to realize that it was possible to do this work online or remote then the world kind of opened you know in a total different way yeah. and my ex at that time like three years ago maybe now two and a half three years ago uh, he got a job offer in Portugal, in Lisbon. In Lisbon. Okay. And then I thought this was when I had one year left on my master in sexology. Okay. So I thought that, okay, I will join him and I can work online and I will bring the kids. And then I also realized because I'm adopted from Brazil that I could invite my biological little sister from Brazil to come and stay with us in Portugal. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, that was a very different or special or difficult or magic. So we came, yeah, so I took her to Portugal and we were in Portugal a bit. We were in Spain a bit and um, I brought my kids. They are now 13 and 10 years old and we also adopted a dog in Spain. So we were kind of in a yeah, it's been a process in wow. so many ways. Yeah. yeah. So how long did you stay in like Spain and Portugal in that area? Was it a couple of years that sounds like maybe? Or? And we stayed like four or five months in Portugal. Oh, okay. uh, and then in Lisbon mainly. And then we were maybe a year in Spain. And we kept traveling around in Germany and France and back to Sweden sometimes because I had tests in university. So then I took yeah. the car back from Spain and I drove to Sweden, took the test. Oh my God. Back. Really? Wow. It was That's crazy amazing. Year. That sounds crazy. Oh my gosh. So yeah, what okay. is interesting. You know, when you do, when you move to a new country or a new place, I think everybody who's listening can, can relate. It, it's like, you know, being born again new things yeah. like you have to figure everything out again and you're totally outside your comfort zone and then you really have to rely on your inner voices and your like inner critic maybe also sometimes like what do I actually need to do now to figure it out and how will I fix it yeah it can be hard <laughs> at least it is for me sometimes you know in new countries like like how do I even how do I even get like transportation? How do I even drive on the other side of the road? You know, all of this stuff, you know, it's just, yeah. you know, how do we get groceries here? You know, all of that. It really is a whole new learning process. You know, where's the pharmacy? How do I get medical help if I need it? All of that. Yeah, <laughs> it's really tricky. And for me, I really appreciate that type of process or that type of, you know, challenges as well. And, and I feel most of the time, I feel very grateful for everything that it actually teaches me mm -hmm. because I learned so much about myself, but also so much about the society where I am. And that's a real blessing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I have to, I have to remind myself to stay in that moment of gratitude when everything's brand new and I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? This is so stressful. I have to remember to bring that back and say, wait a second. <laughs> I'm actually sitting in the Dominican Republic right now on a beautiful beach. You know, I can work from anywhere and try to yeah. bring feedback. Yeah, because it, it can it can be hard for sure. It's like a whole new level of stress that, you know, most people really don't have in their day-to-day -day lives for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. So, okay. So you went to, you went to Portugal. Your sister was there, your ex, your kids. And then 
at what point do you guys decide, all right, we're going to leave here. We're just going to start traveling around to different places. Like, how did you make that decision? And what is it like having the kids with you? You know, I'd love to talk about that stuff because that's a huge, like, pain point for a lot of people that want to live this lifestyle. They can't yeah. because they're afraid to take the kids places, you know, or to just travel the world with the kids. So I'd, I'd love to hear about that process, yeah. how it's going and how the kids are learning, you know, yeah. all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a mix. And now we're kind of entering the space where it's different type of regulations, like the school. Because in the U.S., you can homeschool legally. In Sweden, it's unlegal, for example. Okay. Uh, in Spain, it's like partially legal, I think. In Portugal, it's legal. In Thailand, it's legal. Uh, so it's very different depending on where you have your address or like what kind of passport you have. Um and for me or for my family, it's always been important with education or with knowledge, maybe I should say. Um, so when we went to Portugal, the first idea I had was that I would just sign them in, in the Portuguese like system. And then we choose to home homeschool because it's a choice and I would really like to try it. Um, but it wasn't possible to do it because I'm not Portuguese. And I was like, shit. I should have, should have <laughs> known that, <laughs> but I didn't realize that. <laughs> so both of my sons have been studying online uh, in different academies. And in every place we go, we have private lessons as well for like arts or, or gym, gym things or whatever things we find. Wow. Um, and it makes it possible for them to like really choose what they're passionate about and I can just add my, you know, money <laughs> into making that happen. <laughs> so instead of having two kids that are tired of school, that are like feeling it's overwhelming, I have two boys who really appreciate choosing to go diving, to go rock climbing, to surf, to like, you know, push the things that they are interested about. Um, and we love reading. So I just buy the books that they actually want to read and we talk about it. And we talk about the books and the board games and all of the things. And we have so much more quality time together than when we're totally locked in our different things all day long. Mm -hmm. um, but it also means that I'm also the teacher in some ways and actually need to start them. And they are maybe good in that actually oh, but really? we talked about it you know before it's a responsibility that they, they have to help me to take and we all need to contribute um and i think as a parent the maybe the most common question or like anxiety maybe is like how do they do with friends yeah. you know if you move around all the time how do they have friends how do they do like how do you maintain that and the roots and you know all of these worries that we have um, and I think I do as every other parent do that I keep checking in like how do you feel about it do you miss your friends do you like text with them like how do you how do you feel do you still want to travel like when we came back from Spain to Sweden like do you still want to travel because I want to do you yeah. still want to travel and like you're saying yes what does it mean like is it yes right now or is it yes even in one month or is it you know yes because you don't want to go back to school or like what you know what well, what does this yeah. yes mean mm -hmm. um right. and, and how can we you know look at the whole picture together like what is the pros and what is the cons and how can i help you handle the pros and the cons yeah and uh, um, so it's a process it's a conversation that you have to have in a process to see how it actually works Going in network with insurance can be tough. For example, waiting a year to get credentialed in some cases. Filing all the right paperwork is time consuming and tedious. And even after you're done, it could take months to get credentialed and start seeing clients. That's why Alma makes it easy and financially rewarding to accept insurance. When you join the insurance program, you can get credentialed within 45 days and access to enhanced reimbursement rates. They also handle all the paperwork from eligibility checks to claim submissions, and they guarantee payment within two weeks of each appointment. 
Once you've joined Alma's insurance program, you can see clients in your state of licensure, regardless of where you're working from. This is particularly exciting for me as a traveling therapist, as I know it is probably for you too. You can literally be anywhere and still see your clients through Alma. Learn more about building a thriving private practice with Alma at helloalma.com slash Kim. That's hello, A-L-M-A dot com slash K-Y-M to get started. Oh my God. Right. That, that's amazing advice. It really is. And I'm, I'm guessing so far the pros are outweighing the cons and they're enjoying it pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> they fun. do. And yeah, they do. Sometimes I, I try not to think or... I'm trying to measure maybe the the number of conflicts we have every week, for example. Like how many yeah. conflicts do we have about studying and about, you know, what are you eating or what time should you be home? You know, these ordinary conflicts. Um, and I think in this one and a half months since we've been in Thailand, maybe we had three or four conflicts that was like, you know, reasonable to have about reasonable things. But it's only like three or four. And then for me, that's a good measurement on how we enjoy and adjusting to this lifestyle together. Amazing. So how how did you guys pick Thailand? I mean, and, and you guys decided as a family where you're going to go next and how long you're going to stay places? Do you use that same sort of like conversational negotiation type weighing the pros and cons to figure out? Almost, um, or or yeah, similar similar way. Because when when we left Spain the last time, I broke up with my partner, uh, or he broke up with me actually, which is also one of the things that you really can learn a lot about, like how what happens when you actually move a relationship or a partnership to another place, and when the balance gets changed because somebody is having a new job and you are, you know, or or whatever it is. So that experience was very valuable, even though it created a lot of like tension or, or uh, sadness or emotions in that specific time. Um, but I started to date uh, Michael, as my partner's name is, or my, this partner, my partner, <laughs> or whatever I want to call it. <laughs> and he is uh, like living the digital nomad lifestyle. Oh. So the year, one and a half years now, we have been dating. Uh, and we basically had one date in the di- like different countries, the first 10 dates or something like that. Oh my God. Um, yeah. So we were in, he's from Austria, but he lives in Germany. So we were in, uh, well, Spain once, of course. We were in Hamburg. We've been in the Caribbean, in St. Martin's. Uh, Vienna, Sweden, like we've been Portugal, we've been traveling and dating for like a year. Uh, wow. And then we just said like, no, we, yeah, it was amazing, really amazing <laughs> year. And now we were just like, no, we have to choose a place so that we can actually live together, all of us, and just see yeah. if it works. Oh. Uh, so we were talking about that, like, should we choose Colombia? Should we choose Thailand? Like, what do we want to choose? And how can we unfold this part of the story or yeah. relationship? That's amazing. Yeah. So you landed on Thailand <laughs> for a while, I yeah. got. <laughs> yeah, until July next year, at least. Okay. Uh, and we were sitting the other day, like, where do we want to go next? Like, do we want to go back to the Caribbean maybe? Or yeah. should we go to Africa? Or like, how should we, what should we do next? So That's it's a very... Yeah, and he has the same mentality for traveling. This is also amazing because okay. usually people are like, no, it's not possible. You cannot do it or like, do, 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 do. And he is more like, how can we do it? I love that. You know? Like, yeah. yes, it's amazing. It's really amazing. It is. It's so special to have a partner that wants to do the same thing I'm doing, <laughs> you know, and yeah. you won't have to about it. Yeah, it's it, yes. quite a gift, you know. To be in a relationship like this for sure. So, so you mentioned Thailand for until July. Is that like the visa length, or is that just like how did you guys decide on that time frame? Mm. 
we because when you're when you're renting long termly, they want you to rent at least six months oh. or like one year. So then we choose to rent this house that we live now for like I think it's eight months or something because we still wanted to travel a bit around in Thailand. Um, and they were okay with eight months, but you still have to figure out the visas or the visa situation for us is that you, I have a multi-entry visa, which means that I can go in and out from the country, uh, how many time I want within 60 days. But within 60 days, I have to go to the immigration office and just tell them I want to stay longer. And then I can extend it with 30 days, like till the end. And it's not a problem. So this is usually what people do. uh, And we we will do the same or are doing the same. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah. Is it a a hard process to go like every 30? I, I guess you have to go every 30 after that initial 60 or... It's pretty easy. Um, yeah, I didn't figure out how it looks. I was there last okay. week. It took me 10 minutes to yeah. get like a Uber or a Grab there. And he asked me if I had an appointment. And I said, no. And he said, okay, then I will wait 15 minutes. And I was like, huh, oh. 15 minutes. Yeah, right. Took me seven minutes inside the wow. office. And then it was done. That's amazing. And then it's renewed for another 30 days or 60 days? Yeah. I think okay. it's 30 days. Um, okay. And because the kids are under 14, I don't need to bring them. So under 14, I don't need to take them there. But the visa is also just renewed. Wow. That is amazing. Yeah, because yeah, I'm in the Dominican Republic. We were just here two months, for two months, like a couple months ago. And we didn't realize that, that basically here you can overstay your visa. And it's just literally when you leave, they just charge you like a, not a five, but like a... They just charge you per day, basically, that you want to overstay your visa. And when we ah. exited the airport at, at Preston, we just, they calculated how many extra days we stayed. And they just said, you have to pay this much money. And it, and that's it. And they're like, they, I, I think they're totally fine with that. <laughs> so. Please take them. It was really yeah. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm so, yeah. I was, so, you know. The more I talk to people, the more I'm finding these little nuances about like visas and how to navigate that piece of it, because that's new to me too. It's, you know, it's kind of scary going into a new country. Like how does the visa, visa process work? How do I navigate this? And, you know, I hear some people tell me like, somebody told me a couple of weeks ago and they're in Vietnam, but they just have to fly out every 60 days. They have to fly over somewhere else. Yeah. But, and I think she said she flies over there for 24 hours and they come back and then it like renews the visa. So there's all these little yeah. nuances for each country. And I don't know. I mean, I guess it's different if you're from a different co- country of origin too. I'm not sure or is it the same for everybody. Yeah. I don't know if you know. No, it's different. It's different because when, okay, for example, when my partner was, um, when he was applying for his visa in Berlin, then he had to have a specific amount of money in his account and I needed to have a different type of like level oh. or, or like number of cash in my account because I'm Swedish and he's German. And I didn't understand what that was about, but it's in Thailand at least, it's about which city the ambassade is in. Oh. So it's also like, yeah, it's it's a mystery every time. Oh. And yeah, but I think Maybe the most important advice, if we would give people an advice, is to not be too scared about it, you know, because at least you're doing something and you're trying something. And if it's, you know, get messed up, well, okay. Yeah. Get messed up. Then we learn something and life goes on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know what happens if you overstay a visa and you're not supposed to. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's everybody's biggest fear is you violate a visa law, but I mean, I feel like people are mostly helpful and will give you, you know, suggestions on how to correct that problem if it's a problem instead of like throwing you in jail or something. I think that's what everybody's afraid of. Am I, am I going to get thrown in jail in a random country because I violated visa law? I don't know. I've never heard of that happening. No, neither did I. And I think if that is the biggest concern, then you are really focused and motivating in not making those mistakes. And then yeah. 
it's hard for me to see that they actually happened if you're really focused in not letting that type of problem or, or anxiety or whatever you want to call it affect you. Um, but I think it's a, it's also a bit of the learning process to be able to step out from your comfort zone and just make a decision and not maybe be so harsh on yourself if it didn't went as you thought. Because bureaucracy is bureaucracy. And we're a therapist. I mean, we are working with empathy and respect and we're working with empowerment and all of these values that we really think is important for ourselves and for others. And maybe we need to use the same empathy for ourselves when we don't really figure everything out the first time because shit happens. Yeah, it does. <laughs> That's a good way to sum it up. Shit happens. <laughs> I like yeah. that. And maybe don't take it personal, you know, because yeah. bureaucracy yes. is really hard for everyone everywhere. It's and maybe really we need to remind ourselves that it's not everything that is personal. You know, we don't yeah. have to take things personal. Yeah. And it's, it, it, it's hard for one to find answers. But yeah, like you said, if you take it on as a, like a positive challenge and it's going to be fine, you'll figure it out. Most of us, we're pretty, I mean, we have advanced degrees. You know, we're successful professionals. We can figure this part of it out too, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if we don't, then the same thing. Like, who can you ask? Like, right. How I was going to ask you, what's your process with that? Finding out the visa situation. What, how do you go about, like, investigating that to begin with? Did you move around so much? Um, well, when I was in Portugal and Spain, it was easy because it's Europe. Okay. So I didn't really have to do something specific there. Um. And when it comes to the regulations around the schooling situation or the education situation for my kids, then I usually go into my my like investigating role <laughs> and I look at the laws, like what is the regulations actually saying? And then I double check with somebody like, do I understand this correctly? Mm -hmm. And then I really try to keep in mind that this is not an opinion, this is a regulation. Yeah. And this gives me an answer on something I need to understand. Mm -hmm. But it's maybe not telling me that I need to tell them exactly everything or I should tell them exactly everything. But like it, it could be really different, but I need to choose what it means for me. Like, how do I understand it? Mm -hmm. And how can I use this to create the best place for me and my family to be with or like mm -hmm. to be in? Yeah. And have you ever run into like, like a visa issue or a schooling issue and you just decided we just can't go to that country, that's not going to work for us? Or have you pretty much been able to make it all work? Um, no, I made it all work. My first or like the biggest concern maybe that I've been thinking a lot of is do I want the kids to study according to the UK curriculum or the US curriculum? And how will that be different for them in the future? Uh, and so far, I didn't really decide it. So my oldest one is studying in the U.S. My youngest one studied in the U.S. the last year. But this year, I think the younger one will try Cambridge. Oh. Um, and maybe that's really like not smart to switch in and switch out like this. But based on our situation now, and based on that, they are pretty, they're not so... They're, you know, they're siblings, but they are different in, in many ways. Um, I think that it's benefits for me to understand the different curriculums that's way, like along the way. Yeah. Um, but my main concern or my main priority is that they will have an education in the future that is really useful and helpful for them. Mm -hmm. um, and English is our second language. So we are developing our English all the time when we travel like this and when we read in English and with my partner, we speak English as our first language at home. And so I see a lot of benefits with all of it, uh, even though I didn't figure everything out. Yeah. <laughs> well, it sounds like you're, you're kind of taking it one day at a time with the whole thing and just like adjusting to what each of them needs when they need it and being super flexible about it too, which I think is pretty amazing. Yeah. I'm trying at least. And I think, you know, there's a lot of stress that we have in our daily life in general, but being able to live like this and to travel like this and to work with something that I'm very passionate about, which is sexual and reproductive health, yeah. then life is pretty good in yeah. so many ways. Yeah. yeah. 
I love that. Oh, that's a good, that's a good way to, to end this. I think that's fantastic. Now, if people want to talk with you, do you, I can't remember from your bio, do you work with therapists or do you do coaching at all with therapists around this stuff or is it mainly I do. Your, the psychologist? Okay. Could you tell us about that? Or if somebody wanted to work? It's depending on, again, like it's depending on the regulations and the blah, 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 blah. But yeah. I think usually I just suggest that people go in and they book like a discovery call. Or, okay. or like a free, you know, small session. And we just ch chat about what's your situation and what are you longing for? And, and like, where do you want to go? And then we can look at how that path will be. And right now I'm putting together a coaching program for adoptees to work with their sexual and reproductive health. Um, both because this is what I wrote my master thesis about, but also because I didn't see any therapist or any coach that is specialized in, in sexuality or sensuality or, or intimacy connecting with uh, adoptees. So I was like, oh. it's a hole here. Like, yeah. I should do something <laughs> like Absolutely. because I understand it. And yeah. uh, so I'm launching that program after New Year. I think right. if I got it. Yeah. The best plan. That's how I am. I'm like, I have a really good idea of what I'm going to launch this. I'm just not sure exactly when. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's excellent. And I can throw relations out of me, just like noticing that there's a hole that needs to be filled and then feeling passionate about that hole and then trying to like offer a solution to help others with that. I think that's amazing. Yeah. 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 Because when I was writing the thesis, I was interviewing 20 adoptees in this subject and I just realized because I had a hunch that this is a, an area where we actually need to understand each other and myself more. And I think everyone I spoke to said the same. It's like, wow, wow I never talked about this before. And like, how could I went to therapy and nobody asked me this? Or how can we, you know, like it's, it, it awakened more questions than answers. Um, so I, I emailed the government, the Swedish government, who is doing like a commission about adoptees and adoptions right now, because they realized that not so many of them were made like legally correct wow. between, I don't remember which year. And I emailed them and I said that I, I read your plan with the focus groups and everything, but you're not mentioning sexual and reproductive health at all. Wow. And the, the Ministry for the Public Health in Sweden, they didn't mention it. And the social service like uh, place didn't mention it. So who is, who is mentioning it then? Because you're talking about human rights and you're talking about the public health, but you're not even talking about sexual and reproductive health and how, how can you miss it? Right. Um, wow. yeah, <laughs> I'm writing them a summarize for their report under like the first three months next year as well. Amazing. Um, so that's also going to be interesting and it feels really important to contribute yeah. in this way to something that I'm like, knock, knock, knock. Like, yeah. are you here? <laughs> Do you yeah. see it? what I see? Yes. And what a huge impact that's going to have, you know, just like the broader impact and having information like that in place where, it, where it's non-existent in these policies and in the ways that they're helping people. Yeah. So that, that is amazing. Yeah. So I feel very, very, thank you. I feel very, I'm a little scared also, you know, the, the, what do you call it? The imposter syndrome feeling when you're stepping out all the time doing something. But I also feel very like empowered by the experience of giving the group a voice in this field that they didn't really have before. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really feeling like happy about that in a personal level and of course in a professional level as well yeah oh my gosh amazing thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today thank i know it's cool yeah and we'll put all of your information in the show notes if anybody wants to work with anna please feel free to click through and and meet with her have a discovery call with her i really see thank you thank you <laughs> thank you Thank you so much for listening to the Traveling Therapist podcast. For show notes, links, and downloads, head over to thetravelingtherapist.com, where you'll be able to learn more about my journey, the courses I've created for you, 
and other exciting resources to make your dreams become a reality. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share with your traveling therapist friends, subscribe to the podcast. And if you love this episode, please leave a review.